and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Because I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. If I had a pound for every politician I've heard steal that line, I'd be a rich man. Indeed, if I had a dream for every time I heard them claim that they had a dream, I'd sleep like Rip Van Winkle every night. Those speeches weren't just well-spoken, well-phrased and thrilling to hear. They created exactly the effect the speaker wanted. Churchill persuaded the British people that against all the apparent odds, the war could be won. And Dr King added such religious fervour to the civil rights movement, made his dream so vital so urgent that he hardwired it into the nation's consciousness and it still resonates today all round the world. Over the next four days I'll be looking at the great rhetoric of the past but also examining how rhetoric is used today in politics, the law, religion, business and even after dinner speaking. And how rhetoric continues to be used to persuade us, to motivate us, to shame us, inspire us and control us even in a world which is now dominated by the electronic media. But exactly how do we define rhetoric? Here's the writer and lecturer, Dr Peter Jones. Rhetoric is the art or the skill or the technique of peaceful persuasion. Rhetorica techne is what the Greeks called it. And it's very significant that it was developed at the same time as democracy was invented. Democracy was invented in 508 BC and in round about 480 BC, the art of public speaking the art of making your case persuasively in public, was developed as a set of rules. Now, of course, people had been speaking persuasively before 480 BC, but no one had ever yet turned that art into a skill. And the point about this is that Greek democracy was open to everyone. Every male in Athens over the age of 18 had the right to speak in the assembly on every single issue that affected Athens, war, peace, taxes, you name it. Now, there were some people who could speak persuasively naturally. But it's not democratic if only those people could have their say in public. Rules of rhetoric, therefore, were invented so that anyone could learn the particular skill of persuasion in public debate. So the connection between democracy and rhetoric is a tight one and a very important one. I would like to first of all reinforce the idea of an egalitarian society. What positive discrimination's purpose is, is to create an egalitarian society where people are equal. Talking about the United Nations... They level students at St Paul's Boys School in London, taking part in a debating competition. For centuries, debating skills were part of any formal grammar school education. Now it's an extracurricular activity and it's just as competitive as rugby or chess. The school's mace competition is now in its 43rd year and around 600 schools take part. Many of the pupils will go on to join debating societies at university, where the competition is as tough now as it's ever been. Probably the Oxford Union is the best known and ex-presidents include Michael Heseltine, Michael Foote and William Hague. When I was at university, debating at the Cambridge Union was something involving enthusiastic amateurs, didn't take it too seriously. They spoke well most of the time, sometimes. They spoke extremely badly, but there was an interest in persuading the audience in front of them. These days, it all seems to become much more narrow-minded and professional. The debaters seem more concerned with winning competitions than impressing their peers in the house of the Oxford or Cambridge Union. And I think this is regrettable. Once you start worrying about point scoring for a jury, you're thinking about how many ideas you've included, whether you've managed to rebut every single little point the other side has made. Uh, You cease to think about whether you're being interesting or boring whether your style is attractive or dull, you you just lose the sense of perspective. So I think this is a regrettable development, and I would like to see university debaters taking themselves a little less seriously and thinking much more about whether their audience is enjoying listening to them.
as chairman of the school's debating association committee, David Bussey, who's a teacher himself, knows just what skills he wants his students to nurture. It is all a matter of feeling that you want to persuade an audience of particular things, presenting them in a clear, simple, rational manner, remembering that an audience can't take in many points, maybe three in the space of five minutes, maybe only two, uh, and working on that, good examples, a sense of humour, repeating points, guiding your audience through, uh, not overestimating their capacity to absorb things, but above all, getting away from your notes. So it is as if you're speaking to the audience rather than reading out a statement. The most influential book ever written about the subject was Aristotle's The Art of Rhetoric, which he wrote in the 4th century BC. He divided rhetoric into three sections, as Peter Jones explains. Under persuasion by emotional means, he meant primarily that the speaker should present himself as the most amenable, agreeable sort of person, so that the audience would believe him. The second means of persuasion was logical. Now, Aristotle, for example, defined uh, rules of logic, arguments from induction, arguments from deduction, and arguments which he called enthymemes, by which we mean syllogisms. Uh, all men are good, Aristotle is a man, therefore Aristotle is good. Now, now that sort of argument is enormously common, it's the very basis of logical argument. Um, uh, career. Now, yes, that could be a disadvantage, but surely we should address the real problem here. The real problem is the poor education. The real problem is the poor teaching, the lack of funding. Surely we should actually address this point. No, thank you. Now, Stylistics. This is what we tend to think oratory is all about. The way in which you say things. But of course, as Aristotle knew, it's not the way you say it, 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 it's what you say as well that's so important. You may be able to communicate, but what are you communicating about? Nevertheless, once you've decided what it is you're communicating about, then Aristotle produced a whole load of, of rules for the ways in which you can shape an argument. In other words, if you're in a court of law or, or if you're a political speaker, you begin by announcing what it is you're going to say. You then tell the story behind it. You then produce the arguments for and against it. You then summarise it, and you then conclude. Now, that sounds terribly simple, but if you don't know how to do it, then it's marvellous to have those rules laid in front of you. Judging by the low standard of rhetoric in the House of Commons at the moment, you might think that very little was learnt from debating at school and at university. Well, I hope that will change. I hope we have a new generation of, of fine debaters that will enter Parliament in the coming years. But, of course, debating is not all formal debating. If you are in a company and you attend a board meeting, you may need to present your case. And the experience of knowing how to present it precisely rationally and simply, I think, is invaluable. So though there may not be many debating societies for adults, I think there are many ways in which these skills are of very great value in later life. You don't, of course, need to have an academic training to be a successful rhetorician. You can learn the skills by instinct, experience and practice, helped by a wholehearted commitment to your cause, a commitment which gives an urgency to your speech. The Greek philosopher Plato was suspicious of rhetoric for this reason, fearing that tyrants could use their skills to enslave people. Listen to this extract, chillingly effective, hair on the back of your neck tingling, even though it was delivered more than 60 years ago in a language most of us don't speak. Für unseres, für unseres reiches Macht, für seine Größe und für seine Herrlichkeit, jetzt und immer, Deutschland, Sieg ein! I remember of several occasions when I listened to his broadcasts and I felt my spine tingling. I felt, in a way, proud to be part of all this tremendous happening, whatever it was, and I, I mean, I didn't understand everything, but there was something in that voice when it came through the radio that perhaps acted on many people like, uh, <laughs> like a drug. 
That was Marion McKinnon, who heard that speech by Hitler as a child in pre-war Germany. David Bussey believes that rhetoric has to keep up with the times and encourages his students to use language and speech patterns which they're familiar with. Rhetoric has to be speedier these days too. Most of us don't have time to settle down and listen to a long speech, however elegantly crafted. TV's made us used to being spoken to by politicians and persuaders of all kinds, as if they were in the room with us, not on a dais at the end of a hall or a soapbox in front of a crowd. Nowadays, a, a punchier style of language is essential, but audiences can still enjoy the precise selection of vocabulary sentences that are well formed. I mean, Enoch Powell, uh, proud of the fact that he has never uttered an incomplete sentence in his life. What doesn't work is a self-conscious interest in vocabulary and uh, wild metaphors at the expense of content. You're there to persuade, not to show off. Another aspect of style, of course, is the nature of language itself. One thing that Greeks and Romans discovered was that triplets are enormously persuasive. Take the Bible. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now there we have a marvellous set of triplets. And then you find that the triplets ascend. That is, they, they, they get longer in length. Friends, one syllable. Romans, two syllables countrymen, three syllables. Now, there is one aspect of the art of style in a nutshell. Now, Aristotle and Roman writers like Cicero developed these with enormous complexities. But you can see how it is that the way in which you say things, as long as you have something to say, affects your ability to put it all across persuasively. Tony Blair may be the ultimate TV politician who sometimes sounds as if his life was one long chat show. But even he uses the oldest rhetorical tricks when he needs to. Ask me my three main priorities for government. And I tell you, education, education and education. I do not want the Commission to increase its powers against it. Differing. Of course, the chairman or the president of the commission, Mr. Delors, said at press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community. He wanted the commission to be the executive and he wanted the Council of Ministers to be the Senate. No, no, no. In that last example, Margaret Thatcher used two of the best known rhetorical devices the list of three and the contrastive pair, as in, are we downhearted? No. In these ungodly days when few of us listen to sermons, political rhetoric is the main type which we still hear almost daily. I'll be looking at that at the same time tomorrow. Simon Hoggart on the art of rhetoric. The producer was Sue Foster and the editor Simon Elms. In fact, the next part, Politics and Persuasion, is not tomorrow, but at this time next week, when Simon talks to Tony Benn and Anne Widdicombe about the great parliamentary performers past and present.